Hello, welcome to the Texas Legislative Update. I'm your host, David Blackman, here with Jason Modlin, the president of the Texas Alliance of Energy Producers. Jason, how are you doing today? David, it's good to be with you. Hey, man, it's been a busy week in Austin, I imagine, and uh, not just with the session, but with some pretty nasty weather down there in that part of the state. What did, Didn't y'all get hit fairly hard this week? Uh, we were thankfully a little further south than, okay, than Waco, but, but uh, Waco really uh, got hit very hard and um, uh, very, very big size hail. And, oh, man. Uh, yeah, pretty nasty stuff. Did you see that video of, of the, the baseball size hail going into the pool and the Hereford walking along, Hereford steer walking along behind the pool <laughs> yeah. in the middle of that hail storm? That was wild. Um, well, anyway, enough about that. Look, this is the week ended. Uh, we're recording on April 28th. We've got 33 days left in the regular session, and there is an awful lot of business that needs to get done in those 33 days. Um, and so I guess, uh, you know, before we started recording, you were talking about they're working today on Friday and uh, planning to maybe even work into the weekend next week, huh? That's right. Yeah. So uh, first full day uh, calendar today, they, they've they been doing a couple small uh, items uh, the past few Fridays, uh, local bills and and things of that nature. Um, but but this is really the full first full Friday with a, a very long calendar. Uh, they'll get out uh, uh, later this afternoon um, and then it's anticipated next weekend. Uh, they'll work uh, through Saturday, uh, maybe even into Sunday, but 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 probably not. Um, and uh, and then deadline pretty quick approaching. Uh, May yeah. 10th is the deadline for House bills um, to get uh, past their second reading, which is a, a kind of a, a gate uh, that bills have to get through. They've got to be read three times in each chamber. Uh, and so second reading is a, a key. Um, checkpoint uh if you will for those bills to to get passed um and so that's, and that's part for of the bills house that originate in the house right for bills that originate in the house yeah. yes get yeah. very good good uh clarification there um and so uh that's that's quickly approaching and and the the sounds of wailing and gnashing of teeth are, <laughs> are house bills that uh <laughs> are are quickly seeing that date approaching well, you know, and that's uh, pretty common for a session of, of the Texas legislature. So, uh, you know, it all, every time, every session, it all gets kind of frantic around this point. And, uh, but uh, then, you know, people who've been involved in numerous sessions beforehand realize that this is just kind of the way the process is set up. And uh, so, you Absolutely. know, I mean, it helps to create, in some respects, it helps to create that kind of anxiety to kind of force things, the, the process to, to, to work. So um, just, just the way things go, man. And, and I guess the big news this week, or at least some of the big news was how this new sense of, of growing urgency is creating uh, a, quite a lot of conflict. I think public uh, kind of rhetorical matches between the speaker and the Lieutenant Governor Patrick uh, with, with all these issues up in the air now. Uh, that's right. Again, that's not really unusual either, is it? Uh, no, it's not unusual. There, there is a bit of a um, a delay, a bottleneck, if you will, um, in one of the um, legislative agencies that supports both the House and Senate. It's called the Texas Legislative Council, uh, and yeah. essentially, they're they're nonpartisan attorneys that help um, draft legislation. Um, and, and their role has really been expanded over the last several sessions to, to take on more of the duties that staff typically did uh, um, a decade ago, uh, write bill analysis, write uh, background and purpose, um, write some of the explanations for what the bill does. Um, uh, they did this for a variety of reasons, uh, wanting kind of an attorney to look at it uh, so that it would meet some of the rules requirements. Um, but that tends to delay things. Legislative Council has a bit of a review process. And so rather than, 
you know, outsourcing this work to a, a young 21, 22 year old on your staff to, to, to write this. Um, uh, now it goes through a couple different layers. Um, and so Lieutenant Governor Patrick pointed out in, in a tweet, uh, which is how we're getting a lot of our news, uh, these days, um, that, uh, the house had over 1000 bills that have been successfully voted out of their house committee, uh, but have still yet to be filed in the calendars committee. Um, and, and while the chairman certainly can't exercise some prerogative, uh, and, and hold that committee report a little bit, um, uh, that's probably not the case for over a thousand bills, uh, more likely staff have, requested certain things of legislative council and they're simply not back yet um that that uh bill analysis is not back yet uh or their committee substitute is not back yet um and so that's that's creating a, a real bottleneck um and then there's there there also seems to be some 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 differences if you will uh, between the House Parliamentarian and the Legislative Council, and that's resulted in a number of uh, points of order being called on the House floor that have slowed down the process a little bit as well. Um, uh, these, you know, differences in interpretation come up uh, every couple of sessions, um, and so it's it's only adding to uh, some of the difficulty in moving House bills out of the way and taking up Senate bills. Um, and so I, th I think the Lieutenant Governor voiced some frustration on that this week and, and, and probably some senators have voiced that to him. So, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, and he, I mean, in voicing that frustration, he said uh, the, a comment that created, got, got a lot of attention. He said, you know, he, he doesn't have the authority to call a special session to deal with some of these issues. Only the governor has the authority to call a special session. But he did point out, and it's a parliamentary procedure he's used in the past, that he could force the governor to have to call a special session. Talk about how that would work. Yeah, so uh, I think most recently it's re it, it's been as a result of sunset bills. Uh, I think we've talked about sunset on Public Utility Commission and the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, that uh, every uh, so often those agencies have to be reauthorized. And so a couple sessions ago, there were some key uh, agencies that uh, needed to be reauthorized. Um, they were not included in what's called a, a safety net bill. And so um, the Senate opted uh, to not take up those bills um, and, and essentially allow them to die at the end of the legislative session. And that forced the governor uh, to call a special session uh, specifically for those items. Um, you're absolutely right that both presiding officers, either the speaker or the lieutenant governor, can't dictate what a special session uh, takes up. Um, but but there's a couple duties that the legislature has. Um, uh, they have to pass a budget. Um, they're the only body that that can authorize funds out to to be taken from the treasury um uh the the governor or or even uh what's called the legislative budget board can't authorize that that expenditure um uh into the next biennium so 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 that has to occur uh prior to september 1 and then these sunset bills uh those those agencies will start to wind down uh starting september 1 unless they are reauthorized so uh, the, the threat, uh, is, is not direct. I can't direct you to put this on the, on the special session call. Um, only the governor can call a special session. Um, but, uh, by holding some of those items back, uh, you, you potentially force a special session and, uh, you know, it's a, a bit of high stakes chicken, uh, <laughs> uh, may remember that game. Uh, um, uh, and so, uh, I, I want you to act on this item. Uh, I'm going to hold the budget or I'm going to hold a sunset bill, uh, in hopes that, uh, we do have a special session and you add that to the call. Um, uh, and so, you know, hopefully I think, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, everyone is hopeful, particularly right now that, 
they'll get uh, some time away from the building and, and away from Austin, um, uh, be back with their families. And so that, that, yeah. that's certainly weighing on um, uh, the, the desire to be petty uh, right now uh, is hopefully uh, eroding quickly as people are looking out the window and uh, deciding they want to be outside rather than yeah. <laughs> at the Capitol. Well, hopefully, you know, it gets hot in Austin in, in July and August. So, uh, yeah, you don't want to be hot. back there. You don't have to be. Um, you know, one of the one of Lieutenant Governor's big issues, of course, and, and Gov Governor Ad Abbott said it was a big issue for him, too, in his inaugural speech, uh, was fixing the grid and, and, and dealing with the remaining illnesses the, the grid suffers from, uh, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, two bills that passed through the Senate uh, that were part of, of Lieutenant Governor's uh, emergency agenda were Senate Bill 6, Senate Bill 7, uh, that are designed to deal with a uh, shortage of thermal capacity on the grid, dispatchable thermal capacity, and uh, some other uh, reforms to, to how the market works to, to make it send the right market signals to, to build this capacity. And uh, that they were passed uh, April 5th out of the Senate, sent to the House. Uh, took two weeks to get them referred to the State Affairs Committee. And I think one of the Lieutenant Governor's frustrations is that there they languish without a scheduled hearing and uh, no real indication that they'll get a hearing. And I, I just wonder what uh, you might be hearing around around the Capitol. Yeah, so what they did take up this past week was the the PCM guardrails right. bill. Um, that that seems like that's kind of the item of the package of bills to do, to um, uh, strengthen the grid. The the item that's really got kind of the most uh, uh, support out of that committee um, in the House. Um, there's certainly some very important things on on Senate Bill Seven. Uh, that would help um, uh, strengthen the grid, but um, e either the state-owned assets or the state-supported assets, um, the, the criticism of that has really, I, I think, uh, found a home in the House. Um, <laughs> and so hopefully, um, you know, there's continued dialogue on, on areas to improve. Um, the House, I think, has done... Uh, a little bit more on on the transmission side of things. Uh, just yesterday, they passed a, a, a grid resiliency bill. Um, part of the challenges that we have with with the poles and wires are um, that they blow over <laughs> and they fall yeah, down. Yeah, they do. Um, and so, the extent to which uh, um, the legislature can express support for investing in in more resilient lines. That might save us um, when we have wind events, um, and, and that might be able to help us a little more on, on other types of events, whether it's cold or whether it's it's flooding um, uh, down the road. Um, you know, hopefully those uh, uh, <laughs> uh, those folks will get together uh, and re and really move forward with with package. I think um, the legislature has to act uh to put in um some guardrails on the pcm uh and so both sides have to kind of work together um on that front and and i think that there's support on both sides for that it's in what else do you potentially add on to that uh or complement that to make sure that we're continuing to uh, attract investment to the state um you've had a number of generators express that you know they will only build if the PCM uh, goes into effect, um, and so that's, um, I, I think, a couple months ago when those announcements were coming out, it was it was nice. Okay, here's the investment that potentially is coming to the state when the PCM is announced. Now it's being taken more as a threat. Uh, if you know, if PCM doesn't go into effect, we're going to pull out. We're not going to invest in this type of, of investment and new generation. Um, and so that's... Now, wait, to be clear, to be clear, that threat is is coming from generators yes. who have who have for more than a decade now really pretty much failed to build thermal capacity, period, right? Right. There's been some so, replacement, so how much, but that's how about much it. of a threat yeah. is that really? 
I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's it's a threat to just go on about doing more of the business. same, right? Yeah, more of the yeah. same. So I, 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 I got to tell you, man, I get very frustrated hearing that argument from from power generators in this state, and um, you know, the PCM's fine. Uh, it's been adopted by the PUC. It was recommended by ERCOT. I know that. I understand that. But I don't think anybody in Austin believes that that PCM is going to result in the building of adequate new capacity to, to, to deal with the problem that remains on the grid. Right. And it's just really, really frustrating to me uh, that members of the State Affairs Committee, I'm just going to be blunt about it, uh, are going to accept that argument and do nothing again, nothing real to resolve an issue that everybody acknowledges is a problem for the grid and try to pass it off on this thing that's not going to get the job done. So anyway, that's my rant for the day. And yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll leave it there. <laughs> no, <it's>... Anyway. <laughs> uh, understandable. And that, that's and... not necessarily endorsed by Jason Modge. Uh, that's right. right. Oh, thank yeah, you. So... <laughs> That's my, uh, view, good, my view. Good, good caveat there, and thank you for that. Um, no, I, 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 I hear you, um, and, and you hope that um, uh, you know at the end of session we'll be able to point to some concrete things that are improving the grid, um, uh, and 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 not as I've heard a number of times this session that the structure continues to incentivize large customers to get out of the grid yeah. uh to come up with their own solutions um and and while that might seem nice and certainly the the environmental community endorses those types of measures uh remove yourself from the grid create sure. uh <laughs> batteries or solar uh or you know just just go extreme on your conservation efforts um that doesn't benefit uh, uh, you know, the 30 million Texans <laughs> want to make sure we have warm homes and uh, can go to our place of business and things of that nature that really aren't invested in the day-to-day -day generation of electricity. Yeah. Um, and so to hear um, uh, very good, prominent industrial customers in our state say, hey, we'll, we'll go it alone, that doesn't benefit uh, the overall state. And, and so I, I, I hear you hundred <laughs> percent. That was a much more constructive way to put it. Jason. I appreciate <laughs> no, that. No, thank you. Uh, so uh, let's move on. Let's move on to carbon capture and utilization and storage. Um, you know, we've talked several times about uh, several bills that have been introduced that would clarify the poor space ownership and uh, resolve some other issues to, to, kind of uh, make Texas a more attractive environment to invest in those kinds of CCUS projects. But I guess we didn't have any real movement on any of that legislation past week, correct? Yeah, not in the in the Senate. Um, uh, I, I think, uh, again, can kind of be categorized in, in, in two different fashions. Um, uh, Senate had an omnibus bill that, that was filed uh, in, in Senate uh, Natural Resources and it had a it had a rough hearing. Uh, there were a number of uh, landowner groups um, uh, from the Forestry Association on down to the cattle raisers and Farm Bureau and and uh, land and mineral owners. They really had some some very strong objections to the legislation moving forward. Um, uh, there was not a eh, if you'll tweak this and 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 maybe reorganize this section we can get on board. I mean, it was a no. <laughs> and you got to start removing <laughs> whole sections of this bill uh, to the point, I mean, I heard the sponsor of the bill and he started listing off the committee substitute what was not in the bill. And I, I feel like he listed off everything that was in the bill as <laughs> not being in the bill. And so I, I, I was struggling a bit with well, what's still there. Um the House has taken a little bit of a different approach um, uh, in trying to pass some piecemeal items on liability, on tax incentives, 
um, on on property appraisals uh, as it relates to um, this type of uh, emissions control. Um, and, and so uh, those are moving to the Senate. Um, I think at the end of the day, uh, there'll be a few things there that the, the state will be able to point to and say, we're continuing to, to try to be a competitive place to attract this level of investment. I think our greatest gift, uh, though, is large tracts of land. Uh, that being either uh, the, the general land office and, and um, uh, the, the waters that we uh, control off the coast uh, or very large landowners in South Texas, like the King Ranch, uh, that have been able to um, come to the table with operators, come to the table uh, with uh, industrial customers that, that are trying to uh, dispose of this CO2 um, and, and put some pretty good projects together um, uh, that if they can get some regulatory certainty from EPA uh, or if EPA will delegate that to the railroad commission, right. uh, these projects will be, be able to, to get up and, and, and go uh, in, in a few short years. Um, but if we uh, are needing to create big, large units of CO2 storage that have um, many different surface owners um, and and lots of different um, uh, potential legal liabilities, um, uh, I think the legislature has basically said we're, we're not interested in intervening in that um, uh, complexity just yet. Uh, yeah. Maybe that's maybe that's down the road, um, but for now, um, uh, at least the projects that are available today are going to be very large track landowners, um, and uh, and proximity or closeness uh, to industrial CO two uh, that needs to be uh, disposed of. And that's the best model for a C a CCUS project. Anyway, uh, you know, you, you need to be have that proximity to the emitters and the infrastructure to move the CO2, you know, or, mm -hmm. or at least have it economic to build the infrastructure if it doesn't exist. And, uh, you know, that's why there's been such a focus on uh, areas like the Houston Ship Channel and the Golden that's Triangle right. and Corpus Christi and and offshore underground storage space that's controlled by the Texas General Land Office. That's been the big focus so far. These onshore projects, I think you're right, or, you know, without some clarifying legislation, it's just going to have to be the big tract owners uh, doing business, you know, uh, in those, you know, they have close proximity to the emitters. Yep. And so it'll be somewhat limited. Uh, but, you know, in, you know, for the future, uh, you're going to have to clarify that to, to really expand it onshore. So. Anyway, it's it's not something that's do or die for the industry as a whole, and at least we've got that going for us. That's right. Um, so we've talked in the past also about the bill that uh, would it, it have put in place a new incentive that would have incentivized uh, second frack jobs going in, re-entering uh, horizontal shale wells and doing a second frack job on them. Uh, has there been any project on that bill uh, over the past week? Uh, no, and uh, unfortunately, uh, that that fiscal note has really uh, uh, stymied us. Uh, yeah, got a pretty, big bad pretty, fiscal pretty considerably. Note, um, uh, I, I can happily report, though, it did pass in North Dakota, uh, and so <laughs> uh, 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 the Bakken, I think, uh, will will get some reinvestment uh, um, uh, over the next year um, and, and really start to. To, to get this to be proven out. Um, yeah. uh, there, there's quite a bit of R&D that, that will need to take place as part of this uh, to make sure that, that those service companies can, can re-enter those wells, um, run that lateral uh, uh, pretty considerably, um, uh, get, get, get that <laughs> perforation gun back down into those holes um, and, uh, and re-stimulate them. So it's not, there's not something off the shelf right now uh, that can easily plug and play in. Uh, that's part of the reason that, that an incentive um, uh, needs to be put in place by the state to, to attract that type of investment and prove it up. Um, 
but unfortunately, um, uh, we got a, a fiscal analysis that, that makes an assumption that this is going to happen organically uh, over the next two years and, and that um, the state would, would be at a loss um, for severance tax dollars because this activity is, is going to happen naturally. And so, right. you know, on one hand, I, I'm excited. If that proves out to be correct, I'd, I'd love to be wrong on this deal and, <laughs> and, and see that level of investment in the state, uh, particularly the amount of, of the production that the, the fiscal analysis projects, um, uh, pretty solid, uh, increase in production. Um, we had an independent analysis that uh, came back in to, to several of the trades that are working on this bill. And uh, they had a conservative uh, half a million dollar, uh, half a million barrels uh, produced um, uh, by re-stimulating just a small fraction of wells um uh because of the benefit um right. to adjacent wells and child wells that that uh really would benefit from the same strata uh being being um refracted so uh, you know it uh, uh it's unfortunate uh, i think we've got one more kind of uh, uh not even an ace uh you know we're <laughs> pretty low <laughs> uh, a card that we're playing here, uh, inside straight draw or something. Uh, but, um, uh, we're hoping, uh, uh, that, that we can have some life on Monday. Um, that's kind of our last, last, uh, chance out of, out of house ways and means. Um, I think we'll have some, some potentially some positive press, maybe some, uh, uh, support from some of the, the railroad commissioners. Um, but that being said, um, as we opened up with the, the clock is ticking and uh, that that 30 day time horizon and more closely that May 10th deadline to get off the house floor um, it, it is really um, uh, is coming quickly. Oh, well, gosh, well, let's, let's keep our fingers crossed for Monday. We're, we're closing in on 30 minutes here already. Golly time flies. Um, what does next week look like? Any, any, um, preview you have for us for next week so uh um i I think we talked uh last week about grow and strong being in house appropriations they will be on the house floor um on monday um uh they they seem kind of wed together right now uh by by the by the chamber um uh and hopefully that's the case where they'll, they'll both get a hearing in senate finance if they can make it over there uh of course grow is uh it takes uh, severance taxes generated by those counties and allows for those counties to apply uh, to the state for a grant. Um, uh, These are counties with a, high oil and oil and gas activity in them. Right? Uh, with with uh, grow is any amount of production, so any amount okay. of oil and natural gas production, they can apply uh, for a grant to shore up uh, roads, hospitals, uh, education infrastructure, those sorts of things. Uh, strong is a little bit different. It looks at the top uh, 10 to 15 percent of counties um, and says that uh, those counties can apply uh, to the state for, for a grant um, uh, for very similar purposes. Uh, it also has some some diversion, if you will, taking severance tax dollars, putting them back into the Railroad Commission, putting them back into Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. So that has some appeal uh, from appropriators as well. Um, and so we'll see. Uh, I, I, I have every confidence the House will, will, will uh, continue uh, the practice and move both bills forward. Um, and then we'll see what the Senate uh, uh, wants to do, how they want to decide on this. It, it would certainly be uh, a great benefit to local communities uh, if they could retain some amount of the severance tax dollars generated in those communities. There's no question they they benefit from the property tax rolls and the added production in that area, the sales tax expended in those areas. Um, but but a, a, a portion uh, of the severance tax dollars back to those communities uh, would certainly be a nice shot in the arm. Sure would. Sure would. And that's, you know, that's always uh, an issue that comes up any time. You have a big oil and gas play in any location is it, all the heavy truck traffic does impact the roads and and other infrastructure and uh so yeah i mean that's uh those seem like two really uh well-purposed bills so hopefully they'll continue to advance through the process 
Um, with that, unless you have anything else you want to add, we can call this one good and and go on about our weekends. That's perfect. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us and we'll we'll talk to you again next week.